we see the like the garden inside the kibbutz and and we know the place we've been there so many times and we see the same place we know with like terrorists going around we call them they don't answer once again and they're texting we're in the same place everything's okay one of their best friend uh, told us you know what stop calling me i have terrorists inside my house i'm holding the door so they won't take me, my wife, and my three kids, I have no clue where your brothers are. But it was the officer, he says, we're standing in Yair's home, and they're not here. This is the story of our life since October 7th. The one in the middle is Amos. He's my husband. Um, and these are his siblings. This picture was taken a year ago in September when he celebrated his birthday. Uh, it's in our garden. We live uh, in a small city in the center of Israel called Kfar Saba. Um, this is Yair. He's the oldest. He's 45. And my husband has 42 years old and he's the middle one. And this is Eitan and he's 37. Um, He's a very funny guy. He always enter a room and five minutes later, everyone falls in love with him. He's like telling jokes, he sings, he would perform. He's, he's an amazing person. And the Yair, uh, after the army, he went back to Argentina for a few years and then he came to Israel. He has a different sense of humor than Eitan. He's more like sarcastic. Uh, uh, he's the handyman of kibbutz uh, near Oz. Is literally on the border with Gaza. It's less than one mile from from the border with Gaza. It's a very small kibbutz if you compare to the other kibbutzim. Let's say Faraza is a kibbutz with 1,000 members. Near Oz is a kibbutz with 400 members as to October 6th. Um, as I told you, he lives in the Yair lives in the kibbutz and Itan lives in Kfar Saba in the same city where I live. But he was visiting his brother for that weekend. Uh, actually, it was between jobs, so we took um, kind of like a few days off. They also invited my husband to join them, but we had other programs with the kids, so it was just the two of them in that apartment. And on 6.30 in the morning, we heard the siren. Uh, now, I don't know how many conversations you had with Israelis, but on one hand, it's not so strange to have a siren. Where I live, it's not happening very often. So it was strange, but we had rockets and, and missiles in the past. So we have like this thing where we know that my husband takes Gali and I go and take Ariel and we run to the safe room. We close the door and after closing the door, the first thing we do is take the phone and call Yair. Uh, which, by the way, Yair would always laugh that we always call him when we know that there's a rocket or a missile attack. And he says that his community, they live so close to the border that most of the time it's not a danger because all the rockets are just going, passing from, from going through. Uh, so we call him and he's not answering the phone. It kind of hangs and, and we, like, we understand that something is happening. But then he texted us saying, we're in the safe room, everything's okay. Okay, where I live, we have to stay for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, since there, were not, uh, there was not another siren, we uh, entered back home. Since it was a Saturday, I had the program of sleeping till late this day. So I kind of tried to go back to bed. I take my phone, I open the news app and We see the, the people from the news talking about an invasion. We see pictures of those Toyota pickup cars full of, of terrorists. Um, we see the path, the, the, 
we see the like the garden inside the kibbutz and and we know the place we've been there so many times and we see the same place we know with like terrorists going around and they're shooting all over and and they're burning houses and i think at first we were like mother i mean it must be a mistake i don't know we had really hard time assimilating understanding what what we're seeing we call them they don't answer once again and they're texting we're in the same place everything's okay um till now i don't know if they didn't talk about the fact that they have terrorists outside their houses because they didn't want to worry us or, i i don't know they they never mentioned that fact um it was for an hour like this we've been watching horrible things going on super worried texting them they're saying they cannot pick up the phone but they're texting and saying same place everything's okay last message we got from them was at 7:30 a.m. it was only an hour uh and then we stopped getting answers of course we we texted we called everything and and they just didn't answer i tried i'm the optimistic person in the house so i was like don't worry i guess they ran out of battery or we saw how they're shooting the electricity down in all the kibbutzim so i said maybe i don't know the the the, the signal i don't know something had happened so don't worry in a few minutes they'll they'll call us back which they didn't and then the second part was trying to call all the other friends we have in the same kibbutz a very good friend of yair is saying I don't know because I'm in the safe room and the safe room is exactly in the middle of the of the house so so you cannot look like towards the back of the house where Yair's home is and and he's telling us that there are terrorists as we speak inside his home so so we just don't know and we try to call another friend and another friend and and for many hours kind of calling all the friends until one of the friends which is one of their best friend uh told us You know what? Stop calling me. I have terrorists inside my house. I'm holding the door so they won't take me, my wife and my three kids. I have no clue where your brothers are. And I think it was like, I don't know, maybe the first time where we kind of understand what's going on. Uh the day went by and at 6:30 the army arrived to the kibbutz. The invasion started 12 hours before when the army arrives to the kibbutz there are no terrorists inside the kibbutz they finished their job at around 3:30 they were according to the according to the army and the security cameras around 1000 terrorists entered the kibbutz that day among them women and kids and it's important to say and in the security cameras you see those kids with weapons and uniform i mean not just kids who joined and in the kibbutz they have the small group of first responders that i guess there are no more than 15 in in this groups and because nothing like this had happened had ever happened before so all their weapons of the first responders are in a specific place which the terrorists knew where the weapons are they had maps they found on their bodies they had maps of all the places and not only in iroz in all the kibbutzim they found maps of where is the house of the man who is in charge of the security the first responder group where are the weapons where exactly they knew everything so it's at 6:30 the army arrives and then they starting going house by house unfortunately the numbers in near oz are terrible out of 400 people in that kibbutz on that day 100 did not survive 75 were taking hostage and 25 were murdered later on we discovered that uh the numbers are a bit different be- because part of those 75 they took the bodies they killed them and then took the bodies and part of them we believed that they were taking hostage but then they found their ashes later on because it was very hard to find they just burned most of the kibbutz so so one out of four is 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 a victim i mean all the kibbutz was victim um so they started going house by house and they're taking all the people out of the safe rooms into a, a small place in the kibbutz with this army around and our friend is sitting in this place it was the kindergarten and he describes how he's looking at the entrance door 
waiting to see who's coming next. Our friend asks the officer to go to Yair's home to see what happened. And he said, we brought everyone who's still alive. So if he's not here, he's not alive. And our friend says, cannot be. Can I go with you? Because they didn't want to let him go by himself. So he went to the house and he calls us from the house. It was not him because he could not speak, but it was the officer. He says, we're standing in Yair's home and they're not here. And I think I was, I can't remember exactly, but I think I was very like, okay, okay, they're not, they're not here. Maybe they went somewhere else. Uh, did you go all, did you check all the public shelters around the kibbutz? Did you? And I kind of started giving him instructions of, of where to look for them because I'm the optimistic person in the house. And he says, you don't understand. They're not here. I don't think we understood it by now, but we try. Um, so, so this was like the first time we know what in a way had happened, which for us, it was like a huge struggle to understand. I don't know if you can see, both of them are kind of big. You, you don't disappear all of a sudden. So, so days went by. So my husband was sure that they killed them and they just like, didn't identify the bodies yet. And I was sure, I don't know why, that no, they're alive and they were taking hostages. And it was for many, many weeks that we had no clue what happened to them. We knew where their phones are and we knew that their phones are in Gaza, but we also knew that the phones of all the kibbutz members who also survived were in Gaza because they just stole everything. So it was not a proof for us. and and. The first time that we actually knew something was on November 25th, which is a long time after October 7th. It was during the hostage deal, uh, and part of the women who were liberated with the kids are from Kibbutz Niroz, and they told us that they saw them. Uh, both of them are taking medications. Yair has uh, pre-diabetes, and Eitan has this um, something in his skin that he takes medication every day. They're dependent on medication, which we know that they're not getting there, of course, unfortunately. Um, and since then, we don't know anything and we're depending on the news because we don't have any other source of information. And, and our life, I mean, I always say they're the ones who, who are being hostages and, and and on November 25th, it was the first time we could actually breathe normally because we knew that they were alive. But on the other hand, those women also told us about the horrible conditions that they're, they're in. So this is the situation. Uh, and, and once again, 136, we know that I think almost 30 out of the 136 were murdered. I think that's it. I mean, you were talking about the fact that you're going to go back to your countries and tell the story, which for us, the families, is very important. And I want to thank you for that. And I also want to add, if I may, a small thing that when you do it, try to focus on the fact that this is a humanitarian issue. Because I think that especially in Europe, but not only, many people are going to try, are trying to put this story in a context of something bigger and they would say that it's because of the ongoing war and the not so conflict and the right wing and the left wing and all those kind of things, which I believe that the first thing should be separate the two of them. These people in that region were people who believed in peace. So my message is keep this story out of politics. Those are civilians. My two brothers-in-law were kidnapped from their house in their boxers with no shirt. They were taking barefoot. They made them walk barefoot towards Gaza. This is not a political issue and it has nothing to do with, politically, with politics. And this is something that I think that we need to, to mention and, and focus on it over and over again. Um, and the second thing is that October 7th was a long time ago. 
in terms of of media and press <coughs> and, and and news so many things are happening all the time so if you are starting those conversation and helping us to keep those stories on the top of the media all the time it helps us a lot because we're afraid that the world will we forget and that will just turn into those 136 that ah, who remembers so so those are kind of the two things that that we as as families ask from you <laughs>